The, uh, the other is what I wanted to say is that, uh, you know, sometimes when you preach, all the, all the Bible's important, important to God, important to you. But in sometimes when you're preaching a message, you realize that the emphasis is on you, some, something that's really important for you to know. And this is going to be that. But if I would think about uh, importance, the message that we're going to be preaching today is important to God. Not more important to God than you, but, but this is what we're going to preach. I'm preaching for the Lord. I'm preaching to reveal something about Him to you. And, uh, and it, it's a carryover from our beginning, what we started to study last week, about sanctification. I've entitled the message, Four Aspects to Sa Sanctification. And, uh, and we're really going to, we already looked at two, so I'm going to cover those first two and then cover a third one. The fourth one I barely am going to mention, if I remember to mention it when I get there, because we'll pick up on it next week. But there are four aspects to sanctification. So in scripture reading, let's start Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 1. It says, The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Again thou shalt say unto the children of Israel, Whatsoever he be, whosoever he be of the children of Israel, or the stranger that sojourn in Israel, that giveth his, any of his seed unto Moloch, he shall surely be put to death. The people of the land shall stone him with stones. Now to give a seed to Moloch is to offer your children in sacrifice to a pagan god. And, uh, and it goes on to say, And I will set my face against that man. Now, I've always pointed out to people that in Israel's case, under, under their law, under gov uh, God's governing laws to them, that if a man offers his seed to Moloch, they're to kill the man. That's physical death. But if they kill the man, how does, how does verse 3 happen? where it says, and I will set my face against that man and will cut him off from among his people. That's God cutting off the man from the blessings of the nation of Israel. That's the man being damned by God. But it goes on to say, uh, uh, because thou hast given his seed unto Moloch to defile my sanctuary, to profane my holy name. And if the people of the land do any way hide their eyes from the man, when he giveth his seed unto Moloch, and kill him not, then I will set my face against that man and against his family, and will cut him off, and all that go a-whoring uh, after him, to commit whoredoms with Moloch from among the people. And the soul that tur turneth after such as have familiar spirits, and after wizards, to go a-whoring after them, I will even set my face against that soul, and will cut him off from among his people." Sanctify yourselves, therefore, and be holy, for I am the Lord your God. And ye shall keep my statutes and do them. I am the Lord which sanctifieth you. And everyone that curses his father and mother shall surely be put to death. He hath cursed his father and mother. His blood shall be upon him. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we do open up your holy scriptures and realize how holy you are. And as we read these verses concerning your governing of the nation of Israel and your law to the nation of Israel, may we learn some things uh, about you in these, not trying to apply the doctrine that belonged to Israel to us, but certainly see some things about your character that when you turned to us Gentiles and saved us by your grace, that we might realize what your character is like. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now, I told you that it's verse 7 and 8 that we really are part of our lesson today, but I thought, well, here's October, and it's Halloween time, and these things about the familiar spirits uh, are, are mentioned there. The, the Moloch thing is really, uh, there's another application we could draw from that, especially when uh, think about abortion, but, uh, but the, the, the familiar spirits and, and the wizards and all of that you know, I'm not so much, there are ministries that are totally against kids going out, trick-or-treating, getting candy, and you can decide whether you're for that, against that. Um, but it is also a time in which witchcraft and that begins to be talked about and people get tempted to look into and, and study those things. They are real. They are doors to spiritual darkness and spiritual wickedness that we're not to be a part of. So I, I read those verses just as a warning. 
But it's verse 7 and 8 that's a part of our study today. Verse 7 says, Sanctify yourselves therefore, and be ye holy, for I am the Lord your God. And you shall keep my statutes and do them. I am the Lord which sanctify you. In the, those verses, I want you to see two things. The Lord sanctified the nation of Israel, but he first tells them in verse 7 to sanctify yourselves. So there is, God sanctified that nation of Israel. He set them apart. And we talked about sanctification means to be set apart unto God as holy. And I keep adding this to part of the definition. It's set apart unto God as holy for his use and purpose. Uh, there's a reason you're set apart. There's a reason Israel belonged to God. And that is he has a purpose for us. And he wants to use us. And, but he, only, he uses us as we sanctify ourselves. And, and so the Lord first sanctifies the nation of Israel, sets them apart from other nations to be his. If you look at verse 26, it says, And ye shall be holy unto me, I, am the, I the Lord am holy, and have severed you from other people that you should be mine. So he, there's the separating out, it belongs to him, he's made them holy for his use. And now because they're set apart as holy for his use, they are to set themselves apart as holy because they belong to the Lord and he is holy, so they should be holy. And so the, the idea there is the sanctification of the nation of Israel. And, and I want you to see that God does sanctify them. And at the same time, there's this practical sanctification that we're going to be focusing more in on today. Now, this is the nation of Israel, but we started looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 10 last week where we did our scripture reading and talking about the fact that we are sanctified today in the age of grace. And it's not 10, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And over there in verse 9, we read these. It says, Know ye not, no, know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effemates, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. By the way, effemates, men who act feminine, abusers of themselves with mankind, other places is homosexuality. Nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Now that's not the only thing in the list, those two things that I pointed out. Uh, fornication, idolaters, adulterers, all those other things as well. Thieves, covetousness, drunkards, revilers, those who just want to argue and yell and scream and fight. Extortioners that, that steal people, fraud them out of money. Shall, they shall, they're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. And the thing is, is that in, in any of those cases, every one of us used to be one of those things. And it, that's why it goes on to say, verse 11, And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the, of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. And then if you look over in verse 19, What know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Uh, one of our closing verses will talk about the triune man, body, spirit, soul, and body. You notice that all you read at the end of this verse is to glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. Where's the soul? Well, when it says your, that's you. That you are the soul that has a spirit and a body. And he's, he's talking to you to glorify God in your spirit and in your body because those belong to God. You belong to God. And, and so we're to, to be holy and uh, God has given us the Holy Spirit uh, for that purpose, that we can serve God in holiness. Now, back over in verse 11, it named all those sins and certainly sometimes we can identify with those sins, but we have been washed from all those sins. Notice at verse 11, ye are washed, ye are sanctified, ye are justified. You're washed by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. When he died on the cross, he cleansed you of your sins. He paid the debt of all your sins. You're sanctified by the Holy Spirit. God put his Holy Spirit in us, set us apart as holy for his use, and he gave us his Holy Spirit. And then it says ye are justified. It's God the Father who declares us righteous. 
He imputes the righteousness of Jesus Christ to our account, and God the Father declares that you are righteous. And he can do that in the name of Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. So you see the triune Godhead involved in, the fa in verse 11 there, and that second one there that you're sanctified. Sanctification seems to be a work of the Holy Spirit in our life. And, uh, and, and so we have been sanctified, uh, we have been washed, sanctified, and justified uh, by the Spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God, and that, uh, that the Holy Spirit now indwells us. So a holy God, God being holy, all that belong to Him and those that He uses is for, the pur for His purpose must be holy. Um, and one of the things I want you to see as we look at some verses here is how holiness is something that, like, no man could dwell in the presence of God if he wasn't holy. Yeah, the, the, in Isaiah, where Isaiah chapter 6, where the seraphims appear and they say, holy, 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 Isaiah realizes that he's a man of unclean lips and that he's going to die because God is coming into his presence that they took coals off the altar and, and cleansed him, which is a picture of what, what Israel's cleansing through the sacrifices that they offer so that he isn't going to die before God. You read that several times where someone who's going to go into the presence of God realizes they're going to die because they're a sinner and sinners can't stand in the presence of God. But it's God who brings sanctification, who brings the washing, the sanctification, and the justification. It's God who's provided a means for sinful men to become accepted in the beloved, accepted before God. And, but God, the point of all this is that God's, God uses holiness and desires holiness and only uses what is holy for his purpose. And so when he was using the nation of Israel, he set them apart unto himself, he sanctified them, and then called on them to be holy so that he could use them. Now, in that talking about, just thinking about back in the nation of Israel, the, when God used the nation of Israel, I used a term last week, and prior to the age of grace, when God was dealing with the nation of Israel, he sanctified that nation. He set that nation apart as his nation to be different from all the other nations so that he has a purpose for them, and that's to bring salvation to the rest of the world and to a testimony to the other nations of who the true God is. So there is a dispensational sanctification of the nation of Israel in the Old Testament. And they belong to God, and because they belong to God, they are to be holy, they're to sanctify themselves. In that process, I want you to, I, I should have told you to hold your place in Leviticus, but the book before Leviticus, look at chapter 19 of Exodus. This is where God had just sent the nation of Israel out from, sent, delivered them out of bondage in Egypt, and they're at Mount Sinai, and I just want you to see verse 6 of Exodus chapter 19. It says, Exodus 19 verse 6, it says, And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests, and a holy nation. These are the words that thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. So when God separated out the nation of Israel, it's for them to be a kingdom of priests. That is, they're going to be stand between holy God and sinful Gentiles, and being sanctified, they're going to bring the Gentiles unto God. So they're going to be a kingdom of priests, and they're going to be a holy nation. God had a means to make them a holy nation. Now they're going to become a holy nation because the Lord Jesus Christ is going to go and die on the cross and pay for their sins, and once he, once he dies, buried, and rises again and ascends into heaven, he pours out the Holy Spirit on the believing remnant of the nation of Israel. And, and when he did that, that's when the nation of Israel becomes a holy nation. In 1 Peter, I'll read this verse to you because there's others we're going to look at. In 1 Peter chapter 2, Peter addresses the believing remnant of Israel and he says this to them in verse 9. Ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now a lot of times people read 1 Peter and say, see, we're a kingdom of priests. No, Peter's writing to the believing remnant of Israel, 
And now that Jesus Christ has cleansed them by dying on the cross for their sins, and the Holy Spirit has been poured out on the believing remnant of Israel, that's the early part of the book of Acts, now Peter can say, now God saved them to be a holy nation. And the believing remnant, when we studied last week, when the Apostle Paul went out and was persecuting the Jews, he, it, it was real clear, he said he persecuted the saints. He persecuted the believing remnant of Israel. He didn't, believe, he didn't persecute all the Jews, he was a Jew himself. But he persecuted anyone who would believe on Jesus as their Messiah. He, and they were called saints. He persecuted the saints. And, and now Peter, talking about those group of people, says you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. That believing remnant became the holy nation because they have been sanctified. The Holy Spirit has been poured out to them that Jesus Christ cleansed them by his blood and poured out his Holy Spirit unto them that they should show forth the praises of him that called them out of, dark, out of darkness into his marvelous light. So in the Old Testament, the nation of Israel, God saved them for that purpose and through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and the pouring out of the Holy Spirit, they became what God called them out to be. The believing remnant became that royal priesthood, that holy nation. Now, we, we, we'll talk about God interrupting that program in just a minute, but as we even think about them being that believing remnant, and, and now that they're sanctified, that there's that positional sanctification. They are holy. They are set apart unto God as a holy. They're a holy nation. That's positional sanctification. But there's also a practical part of their sanctification. And that is, if you come over to Exodus, I hope you're still in Exodus, that's why I left you there. And, and look again at verse 6. And remember that he, he, that he says, Ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Now come over to Exodus chapter 28. Oops, I'm not going to do that, I guess. Exodus 28, and now even within the nation of Israel does God sanctify uh, a tribe unto himself and a family within the tribe, and that is the tribe of Levi and the family of Aaron, because they're going to be his priestly tribe and the priestly, high priestly family. And, and so what you have them is God separating out the, within the nation of Israel their priesthood, and so in chapter 28 and verse 1 it says, And take thou unto thee Aaron and thy brother, Aaron thy brother, and his sons with him, after, uh, from among the children of Israel, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office, even Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, Ithamar, Aaron's sons. Now, uh, Nadab and Abihu, they die because they didn't practice what God said to practice in the priesthood properly. Uh, but we're not going to go there. And thou shalt make them holy garments, verse 2 says, for Aaron thy brother, and for glory and beauty. And so it goes on listing the garments of the priesthood in this chapter. Come over to verse 41, of Exodus 28. It says, And thou shalt put them, a put, shall put them upon Aaron thy brother, and his sons with him, that is those holy garments that they just made, and shall anoint them, and consecrate them, and sanctify them, that they may minister unto me in the priest's office. And thou shalt make them linens, linen breeches to cover their nakedness, from the loins even unto the thigh they shall reach. And they shall be upon Aaron and upon his sons when they come in unto the tabernacle of the congregation, or when they come near unto the altar to minister in the holy place, that they, may, that they bear not iniquity and die. It shall be a statue forever unto, the, unto him and a seed for, after him. So here they, they, take the nation, they take that family of Aaron, make these clothing for them. And, and there's three things that I want you to realize as we think about him separating out that priesthood and that nation. It's, the first thing is in verse 41. It says, And thou shalt put them upon Aaron thy brother and his sons with him, and shalt anoint them and consecrate them and sanctify them. Why? That they may minister unto me in the priest's office. They have to be sanctified, set apart as holy, so that they could minister to the Lord in the priest's office. God uses holy vessels for his use. 
And so these are going to be separated out from among the nation of Israel. They have to be consecrated and sanctified for the Lord's use. And that's important to understand when we talk about sanctification and what I said to you at the beginning, that this is something very important to God. It should be important to us, but it's very important to God. The second thing is that you see in that verse, if they're not sanctified, if they're not wearing those linen breeches covering their nakedness, they're going to die. You don't go, they're going to go before the altar of God, and if they go before the altar of God without being sanctified and, and wearing those garments that are going to sanctify them, they're going to die. No one stands before God in their sinfulness and lives uh, unless they've been sanctified. And, and so if they ignore this sanctification, they're going to die. Now that's the priesthood under the law. And, and remember too, that's what God is calling the nation of Israel to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And he's going to bring the means by which they can be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation because he's the one that's going to sanctify them. And he sanctified them through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and by pouring out the Holy Spirit upon them on that believing remnant. But the third thing I want you to notice in verse 3, and this is just kind of a side thing, it says, and they, shall, uh, and they shall be upon Aaron and upon thy sons when they come into the tabernacle of the congregation or when they come near unto me, uh, unto the altar to minister in the holy place. Now, remember they have a temple and in the whole, they have a place inside the temple that's divided into the holy place and the holy of holies. But all of that is called the holy place. And what it is, is they're coming into the presence of God. That holy place, if you read it back all the way, we don't need to turn back there, Leviticus, no, it's uh, Exodus chapter 25, verse 1. We did read it in Leviticus chapter 20, I think is verse 3. Uh, that it's called the sanctuary. Sanctuary and sanctify. You see that they mean the same thing. There's a place set apart for God. That holy place is the place where God dwelt among the nation of Israel. And when these priests go into that holy place, into that sanctuary, so that they had to be holy. I, the reason I bring this point up to you, where is God dwell today? Where is God's sanctuary today? See, the reason I say that is a lot of people think that there's the fellowship hall over here, there's a church office, there's the Sunday school rooms down here, but now you're in the sanctuary. Everybody calls their meeting place a sanctuary. And they usually call the, the table in front the altar, and they ask people to get up and come to the altar and pray. Where's all that come from? Well, that comes from not rightly dividing the word of truth, not understanding what those things were literal places, you don't just make them something different than what they were in the Bible. But this is not a sanctuary. We call this place the auditorium because it's where the place we come and meet. So where is God's sanctuary today? Yeah, I got people pointing to themselves. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own. The God today, the sanctuary, is in your body. He has sanctified you, set you apart as holy, put his Holy Spirit in you, and he wants to use you. Now, you're going to be his ambassador. You're not a kingdom of priests. But, but you, you are the place that God dwells today. You are the holy place where God put his Holy Spirit within us. And he did it not just to save your soul. He did it to make you useful to him. And just like Israel, there was positional sanctification. There is also practical sanctification. And so last week we started looking a little bit closer at this and realized that in the dispensation of grace today that, well, we could say it this way, some things have changed and some things haven't changed. What has changed? Well, God's dealing with man has changed. He's not dealing with the nation of Israel. He's, he's calling out of the Gentiles a body of Christ, a body of believers. But you know what hasn't changed? God is still holy. God still needs holy people. He only will dwell with holy people so that you need to be sanctified, as Corinthians tells us, through the gospel of Christ. You need to be set apart as holy unto God. And then, because he only uses holy vessels, you need to sanctify yourselves as well. So, 
that, that's where we're going with this now. Now, first of all, we, we look dispensationally, and I don't know if you need this as a review or not, but in, first, in, in Acts chapter 10, we, last week, we looked how Peter, at Acts chapter 9, the Apostle Paul, Saul of Tarsus, is saved, and he's going to go minister to the Gentiles, and it says in Acts chapter 26, I've got to read that verse to you. Go ahead and turn to the book of Acts. You might as well look at them too. Now this is, in Acts chapter 26, this is the road to Damascus. This is where Saul saw the great light and wondering why God put this, why Jesus Christ put this grace on him. Because he was a blasphemer, he should have died. But instead, it's, the Lord said to him in verse 15, And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said unto me, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest, but arise and stand upon thy feet. For I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of those things which thou hast seen, the risen Lord Jesus Christ, and of those things in which will I, I will appear unto thee. You find those things written in Paul's epistles. He, delivered, he expressed to the Apostle Paul the gospel of the grace of God, how Gentiles can be saved by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then it says, and also the purpose that we're saved. But anyhow, verse 17 delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee, to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan unto God, that they might receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. So there's those that have already been sanctified by faith in Christ, and now the Gentiles can be sanctified by faith in Christ and have an eternal inheritance. So that's the purpose of the calling of the Apostle Paul. Now that took place in Acts chapter 9, but now that you're in the book of Acts, go back to chapter 10. Peter gets a vision from God, and the vision tells him to eat things that the law of, of Moses says you're not allowed to eat. And so he refuses to eat after the vision told him to eat. And we read this in Acts chapter 10, and it says, uh, verse 14, but Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spake unto him again the second time, What, thou, what God has cleansed, call thou not common or unclean. Uh, call thou common. So the Lord has cleansed, and, and so Peter doesn't understand what this vision means, that God has cleansed, I can, he can eat anything, he can eat things that weren't in the law. Well, as he sees the vision three times, he now is told to go preach to a Gentile, which we see in verse 28, it says, And he said unto them, Peter's among Gentiles, and he doesn't know why he's there. God had to tell him three times to go, so he finally goes. And he said unto them, Ye know that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company, or to come unto one of another nation. But God has showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. God has cleansed the Gentiles. And now they're free to go to a Gentile. And we're not under Israel's program anymore. There's a new dispensation. God has dispensationally changed from dealing with the nation of Israel, of calling out a people. Look at chapter 15. You know, Peter has to explain this to the 12, uh, to the other 11. And then, so they realize, okay, God's doing something. We don't know what he's doing, but he's doing something different. When you get to chapter 15, they realize what he's doing different is through the ministry of the Apostle Paul. So they're questioning Paul, can a, can a Gentile actually get saved with no circumcision? And they're realizing that Paul had a ministry. Peter's the first to speak. And he talked about how he went to a Gentile because of this vision that God gave him. Look at the conclusion of that in verse 14 from the book that James is now speaking. He says, Simon hath declared how that God at first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. They're realizing that with the calling and commissioning of the Apostle Paul, the vision that Peter had that God has cleansed the Gentiles, that God is calling out of the Gentiles a people for his name. That's what we are, God's called out assembly. We are now, Gentiles are being sanctified. The next book is the book of Romans, chapter 15, and here's the verse we closed last week with. 
Romans chapter 15, in verse 15, Paul dis- explaining his ministry. He says, Nevertheless, brethren, I have written unto you more boldly unto you in some sort, as putting you into mind because of the grace that is given to me of God, that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit has turned from the nation of Israel in the book of Acts to the Gentiles to call out of the Gentiles a people for God's name. That's sanctification. Setting out from among the, the lost a group of people that's now going to be called the body of Christ for God's name, for God's purpose. And so there's that dispensational sanctification that takes place in the dispensation of grace where God's not calling out of the nation of Israel a people for his name. He's now calling out of the Gentiles a people for his name. That is why we're meeting here today. So there there is that dispensational sanctification of setting out the Gentiles as cleansed and now calling out of them, sanctifying them a people for his name. We already read 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11. Ye are washed, we are sinful, we've committed all those sins that are listed, but we're washed, we're sanctified, we're justified in the name of Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. The important to that verse is ye are, not ye shall be. When you trust the gospel that God sent the Apostle Paul out to preach to us Gentiles, where he says in Ephesians, the gospel of your salvation where he talks about in the book of Galatians the gospel that he received from Jesus Christ for us Gentiles. The gospel that he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that gospel is that Christ died for our sins, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And that by believing that, you're saved from your sins. And when you're saved, you're washed, you're sanctified, and you're justified. You're declared righteous on the basis of your faith, in the finished work of Jesus Christ. What God wants people to understand today is that the only way you could be washed, sanctified, and justified is in the name of Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. And so when you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, God gives you the Holy Spirit, and now you're, you're sanctified, you're set apart as His, and that Holy Spirit is going to be the means by which you can live a sanctified life, that you can live a Christian life, a Spirit-filled life. But first, you are sanctified. That's positional sanctification. Now we want to go a step further with that. And that is, just like Israel was told, God sanctify them, now sanctify yourselves. Come over with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Because sanctification doesn't end there. It begins there. First Thessalonians chapter 4, in verse 1. We'll just start at the beginning there. He says, Furthermore then, we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as you have received of us how you ought to walk and to please God, so you would abound more and more. Now Paul's writing to believers. They've already trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior, and they're sanctified in Christ Jesus. And now he's telling them how to remind, reminding them how he taught them how to walk and to please God. And that he's challenging them to abound more and more. Okay, you, 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 you now know how to walk in this world for the glory of the Lord, to please God. But there's more. You can, you can do more. You can abound more and more. He says, verse 2, For you know what commandment we gave you by the Lord Jesus. And this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. Now that's interesting that out of everything he picks, he picks fornication. Because fornication is just natural to the body. It's something everybody struggles with. And and back in, in, in pagan days, where these Gentiles are being called out of paganism, that was actually part of their worship to God even. Uh, But not to get even involved in that way, just to realize that sanctification, that we, you know, we talk about the will of God. We know from 2 Timothy chapter 2, 1 Timothy chapter 2, 
uh, that it's God's will uh, for people to be saved. He, he would not, he, his will is that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. But here's, that, that's the will for people to get saved. Now he's got a will for people who are saved. So verse 3 says, This is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. So rather than be among the fornicators, you should separate yourself out from the fornicators and not get involved in fornication. Verse 4 says that everyone should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and in honor. Now when you talk about your, how to possess your vessel, your body is a vessel. Your spirit and your soul are inside this body. And your soul is the you. And you're inside this body, and according to that verse, every one of you should know how to possess his vessel, his body, in sanctification and in honor. Rather than let the body dictate to you how you're going to live, you need by your soul to dictate to the body how you ought to live. And that is to be sanctified, set apart from sin, and, and, and be honorable to God, to please God in your walk. And you have the means of doing that because God has put in you His Holy Spirit. Now we'll get to that in just a moment. Verse 5 says, Not in the lust of concupiscence, even as, as the Gentiles which know not God. So don't live like a lost person who doesn't know Jesus Christ as their Savior. If you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you ought to come out from among them and be different. And you have the means of doing that and you need to possess your vessel in sanctification and honor. Verse 6 says that no man go beyond, uh, his, uh, go beyond and defraud his brother in any manner, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we have also forewarned you and testified. For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. So we who are saved, his called out ones, we're called unto holiness. And so we need to know how to possess this vessel in sanctification and in honor in order to walk pleasing to God in life. And so this is the will of God for us now that we're saved, to live separate from sinners and separate from sin and to live unto God in sanctification. Set apart as holy, we are positionally set, sanctified and now practically we need to sanctify ourselves. We need to set ourselves apart from sin. Now the way that's going to be done is come over to chapter 5, 1 Thessalonians. I'm going to start reading in verse 14. There's a whole list of things that God has, you know, like Paul started in chapter 4 about the things he commanded them, how they ought to walk. Well, here's a bunch of real short commandments at the end of 1 Thessalonians. It starts in verse 14. It says, Now we, beseech, uh, now we exhort you, brethren, uh, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but uh, ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ concerning you. Quench not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit wants to do a work in your life, and apparently you can quench that spirit. That is, you can, you can work against the spirit until you no longer are convicted about how you ought to live right for the Lord. You can sin and you can sear your conscience from the things that God wants you to do to actually just approve the things that God would not approve of. So he says, quench not the spirit despise not prophesying. For you, that's coming and listening to preaching. <laughs> Prove all things. Hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from all appearances of evil. <laughs> don't just stay away from evil, even the appearance of evil. You don't need to have any fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness that we just heard about in Sunday school. Verse 23, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray your God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So after all the admonition that he gave us in that verse, 
he ends up by saying in verse 23, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. Now that's your whole being. To, to totally set you apart as holy unto him. But not just your soul, your whole being. And then he declares the whole being. And I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the means by which you're to live the Christian life. When it says abstain from fornication, fornication is your body dictating to your soul and spirit what to do. But God wants to sanctify you wholly, and he sanctifies you wholly first through spirit, to your soul, to your body. Now what that means, the spirit is the seat of your intellect. We have, we have God's Holy Spirit bearing witness with our spirit, and God's Holy Spirit gave us the word. It, when, when the Lord Jesus Christ prayed for his disciples in John 17, verse 17, he said to the Father, Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. God the Holy Spirit wants to take the word of God and set apart your mind to the things of God. So there's sanctify your spirit and then your soul. The soul is you. And the thinking capacity of your soul is your heart. You take God's word through the spirit and you put it down in your heart where you make some determinations. Your, your heart is where your will is at. And it's in your soul. And you make a decision down in your soul. Am I going to live for God? Or am I going to live for the flesh? Am I going to live for God and serve Him? Or am I going to serve the devil? You actually make that decision down in your soul. So God sanctifies your spirit. And then your soul. You take the truth of God's word. You hide it down in your soul. So that you don't sin against the Lord as the psalmist said. And then it controls the body. Now your body is set apart as holy unto God. And, and that's, that's, that's how you can live the Christian life and live a life that's honoring to the Lord. Look at verse 24. Faithful is he that calleth you who will also do it. <laughs> when you talk about sanctify yourselves, it's not I'm going to live for the Lord by my own power and strength. No, you're not. But if you take in God's word, God's word, you'll find out, even the next verse we're going to look at, can transform your life so that you serve the Lord, make a decision in your soul to serve the Lord, and your body then now is going to be honored, it's going to be set apart as holy for the Lord's use. And that's the practical sanctification. Come over with me. Oh, by the way, before I leave there, I told you I was going to forget to tell you. Dispensational sanctification, positional sanctification, Practical sanctification, ultimately, and we'll pick this verse up next week, there is going to be ultimate sanctification. And that is when we're set apart from planet Earth, caught up in to, to be with the Lord in heaven, to be used of God throughout the heavenly heavens for his purpose. That ultimate sanctification is when the rapture takes place. But I got one more. Come over to first, 2 Timothy chapter 2. For time's sake, we'll kind of do this a little quick, although it's worth your meditation on this. In verse 14 it says, 2 Timothy 2.14, Of these things put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord, that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Now there's people that have a whole bunch of words to say that have, they're not profitable for your Christian life, and in fact... They subvert hearers. They will, they will actually hinder the spiritual growth. Verse 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And then he says in verse 16, But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. So there's a whole bunch of words that are being used that subvert the hearers and bring about actually ungodliness. In between that is that admonition to study God's word, to show thyself approved unto God, 
a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. And how is all that done? Rightly dividing the word of truth. In verse 17, actually verse 18 and 19, he starts dealing with two men that are actually preaching the resurrection took place already. And it says they overthrew the faith of some. So rather than being used of God, they're destroying God's people by teaching false doctrine that's not rightly divided. So drop down to verse 21. No, 20. Verse 20 says, But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but of wood and earth, some to honor and some to dishonor. At the judgment seat of Christ, your works are going to be gold or silver, or they're going to be wood and earth. That'd be clay. And, and in God's family, there are those that are vessels of honor and some to dishonor. Verse 21. If any man purge himself of these, and we'll just say at this point, dishonorable things. If any man purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, prepared to every good work. That's what you want to be. See, that's important to God, that you be set apart as holy unto him, that you don't want, you don't want to be a vessel of dishonor, you want to be a vessel unto honor, you want to honor God and be set apart unto God's service, meet for the master's use. Only when you're set apart for God's service are you fit to now go serve the Lord. And you'll be prepared for every good work. What's interesting to me when I read this, now that you need to dwell on that more than I've just ex exhorted you, but what's interesting in that, between verse 14, 16, and 17 and 18, people who don't rightly divide the word of truth, they're not honoring God, sanctified, and uh, meet for the master's use. They're actually subverting the hearers. They're overthrowing the faith of some. They are uh, producing more ungodliness. It's the truth of God's word, rightly divided, that prepares us to be spiritually used of God and meet for the master's use. And that's why I said to you at the beginning that this is important to God. He saved you, and that's the beginning of your Christian life. It's not the end. He saved you because he wants to use you for his honor and glory here and now as well as throughout all eternity. And your usefulness to him depends on your sanctification. He sanctified you. Now you need to set yourself apart and let him sanctify you holy, spirit, soul, and body that you might be fit, meet for the master's use. This is important to God. He saved you so that he could use you. And it depends on you making some decisions in your heart of how, what you're going to not only believe, but how you're going to live and how you're going to learn to walk by his spirit to honor him and to be used by him. God is holy and he uses holy vessels. Set your part, yourself apart from the world and be holy as God is holy. Let's pray. Our God and Father, we are challenged by this because it seems almost impossible for us to do this, except that you put that little verse 24 in the fifth chapter of 1 Thessalonians, faithful is he that called you that will also do it. Father, by your spirit and by your word, we can be prepared for and meet for your use, that we can have a, a life that honors you and is set apart as holy unto you and meet for your use. And I pray there'd be some decisions made, even today. First, if someone's not saved, that they realize they don't stand a chance in the presence of a holy God. They need to be sanctified by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, by the Holy Spirit that you give and seal to every believer, and declared righteous by you, who imputes the righteousness of Jesus Christ to our account. And then, Father, we who are saved, may we realize that our sanctification is an important issue now that we're saved, for our use to you, and we pray that we'll take it seriously. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.